This podcast was recorded and provided by the National Association of Regional Councils. For more information about NARC, please visit narc.org. Hello everyone, this is Mia Colson with the National Association of Regional Councils, and welcome to the last installment in our solar podcast series for 2012. These podcasts are brought to you as part of the U.S. Department of Energy Sunshot Solar Outreach Partnership. Through this partnership, NARC is working with the International City and County Management Association, the American Planning Association, and ICLEI Local Governments for Sustainability to support local governments in increasing solar deployment in their communities nationwide. Today I'm joined by Rich Deming, Senior Partner at Calor Energy, and Walter Putnam, Partner at Shift Equity. Rich has worked on biosolar and energy from waste projects since 2004 and advises private and public clients on a variety of energy-related issues from Calor's office in Charlotte, North Carolina. Rich also serves as the energy lead at the Central Atlantic Council of Government. In 2011, Rich originated the Carbon Advantage Program, or CAP, at Calor, which aggregated renewable energy certificates and sold them into the voluntary market. At Calor, Walter managed the CAP program and recently took it with him to the Calor spinoff Shift Equity, which is an environmental commodities trading firm. There, Walter works on expanding CAP into other markets. So I've asked Rich and Walter to join us today to speak about the Renewable Energy Certificate, or REC. So thank you for joining us, Rich and Walter. Great to be here. Absolutely. So can you start by explaining the concept of a REC, like how they relate to a carbon credit? Okay, so a REC is a renewable energy certificate, and, and the, the origin of the concept is basically that, um, you know, energy that is produced by, say, a solar project um, is inherently more valuable and, and better for society and, and in other ways than uh, energy that's created from a coal plant, say. Um, but because of the nature of electrons, when you... Um, once they enter the grid, it's like sort of pouring clean water into a dirty pool. Um, you can't just go get a bucket and get that clean water back out. It just it just gets mixed up in the grid. So it became very apparent um, quite a few years back that there needed to be a way to track the clean energy if there was going to be any sort of programmatic way of tracking it and incentivizing it. Um, because of that, uh, they created these renewable energy certificates. Now, the renewable energy certificates, uh, when you have a solar plant or a, even a, a waste energy plant or a geothermal plant, you generate um, electricity, which is a kil in kilowatts, and it goes onto the grid. And at the very same time, you generate a renewable energy certificate, which represents one megawatt hour of power. And that certificate then is detached from the energy and it's a commodity all of its own. Um, and I'll actually let Walter speak to the carbon credit um, relationship with that question. So when it comes to renewable energy certificates and the relation to carbon credit, it's a matter of scope. There are three different scopes that rate the emission that an individual or company um, has. So therefore, scope one would be company-owned vehicles or on-site fuel combustion for power on-site. Scope two would be purchased electricity, and scope three being employee commute, um, business travel, products purchased for the company, or even the entire supply chain. Uh, you've seen recently that Walmart's taken the initiative to get the people that supply them with their products to look at their greenhouse gas inventory. That, that's an, um, an extension of scope three and Walmart trying to wrap their arms around that. Um, renewable energy certificates relate directly to scope two and only to scope two, whereas a carbon offset would relate to all three scopes. Great. So can you tell me what RECs are used for? A REC, its, it's purpose is twofold. One would be a market tool to incentivize renewable energy production, um, getting the individual that produces green electricity, their green money's worth, so to speak. Um, the second purpose of a REC is to track the ownership of non-electrical attributes of the renewable energy production. So your environmental and social benefit of replacing fossil-derived electricity with renewably sourced or clean electricity. 
And so who would be interested in actually purchasing a REC? The, the folks that would buy RECs, um, you would start with the compliance market. <clears throat> and <clears throat> the compliance market is uh, the market of government and other institutions that are required by regulation or law um, to offset <clears throat> part of their power. Um, there are, across the United States, there are, about, there are 29 states and D.C. and a couple of territories that have renewable energy portfolio standards. Those standards require the utilities in those um, jurisdictions to purchase or produce part of their power from renewable energy. Um, in North Carolina, it's 12.5% by 2021. In California, it's 33% by 2020. So it varies widely. Um, under that regime, um, in order to prove that they have complied, the utilities uh, purchase the RECs from system owners and thus sort of help the bottom line of getting the system installed, create revenue for it, and, and help the entity that's purchasing it fulfill their obligation under those under those rules. The second um, place that somebody would want to buy a REC is in the voluntary market. And I'll let you answer that one, Walter. He spends a lot of his time doing that. Right. So um, the voluntary market is non-compliance based. People are not mandated by law to purchase these. They're doing it for um, potential PR plus, or they've made some type of commitment to decrease their carbon footprint. A great example of this would be <clears throat> universities whose presidents have signed the president's climate commitment. And this is a large group of universities that have put together um, a climate action plan, and they use RECs to offset some of their electrical use. Another great way of doing this is the uh, EPA's Green Power Partnership. And this is where a bunch of Fortune 500 companies Smaller companies as well, but the big players are large companies such as um, Intel, Lockheed Martin, Microsoft, McDonald's, Hilton, you know, big names, and, and they've chosen to offset a majority or a percentage of their electrical use for their entire operation. Um, they partner together with the EPA, come up with a certain percentage. And, and that's one of the beauties of a REC is that it can transfer from state to state or on a national basis. So you can choose each individual operation that would want to be offset. Or you can say, um, you know, I want to buy wind RECs from California. I want to buy solar RECs from Washington State. Um, they're, they're transferable and, and flexible, which is very interesting. Great. Do you know how someone would be able to find out if their state allows for RECs? There, there's actually a, a really good reference online, and I would direct them to go to desire, D-S-I-R-E-U-S-A dot org. Um, based upon the fact that the renewable portfolio standards differ from state to state, and it's a state-mandated regime, as Rich was mentioning, they give you a real nice breakdown of each individual state, how much, what the goals are, how they crescendo up to that final peak number that they that they plan on hitting and um, and any updates and regulatory changes. Thanks. So can you go into a little detail on how RECs are sold or I guess tracked? Absolutely. I'm gonna I'm gonna jump on this one real quick. Um, let's take North Carolina as an example and, and then we'll expand out outside of there. Um, in North Carolina there's a system called NC REPS, North Carolina Renewable Energy Tracking System. And what this is, is, it was set up by the Utility Commission and the Renewable Energy Portfolio Standard. And it allowed for the investor-owned utilities, the municipalities, and, and the co-ops to track the electrical production from people inside of their area and also allow them to retain ownership of RECs, uh, of the renewable energy certificates, and balance the, the amount of electricity that they were selling to the rest of the people in their, in their service territory. What it does is, based upon a certain uh, ANSI certified meter, um, it goes onto the grid, it, it's tracked, and the utility is mandated by law to produce that information to the tracking system. Once it's on the tracking system, it's put into an account. It can be you know, followed. It's got a vintage or a date tied to it, and then 
Secondly, you've got the ability to retire this. Um, when the wreck is retired, it's no longer on the system. It's a, a very stringent uh, accounting-based approach to make sure that nothing is double counted and make sure that, that everything's bulletproof. So I know a lot of our members would be interested to know, but can governments receive the revenue from rec sales in the same way that a private company would? Yeah, um, that's what's really kind of so interesting about RECs, um, particularly from the standpoint of the government. I mean, I know that's your audience, and, and I do a lot of work in that area. Um, a big problem when you're trying to get a project done uh, on a government site, if, if you are if you are a staffer or political person in that government, and is that uh, when you create a pro forma or do financial modeling for a project, uh, if you're in the private sector, a huge chunk of that pro forma is actually for the tax credits. In fact, you almost can never get a renewable project at, at present to pencil out without the tax credits. I mean, we're getting there, but we're not quite there. Um, at present, though, so, so the problem is if you're in a government, you don't have any tax credits, just like if you're in the nonprofit sector. Uh, you don't pay taxes, and so a credit against something that you don't pay isn't going to help you any, and that line on a pro forma is wasted. Uh, we kind of solve that problem with third-party financing and different lease arrangements, et cetera. A REC, on the other hand, is just pure revenue. So on that same pro forma, right under the line where you see revenue for the electricity that's sold, uh, you will see revenue from the RECs. And that, that, how that gets um, translated into money can be kind of complex, you know, as far as what they're worth, if they're long-term arrangements or sold on the spot market, et cetera. But the big important thing is any government can take a check for the RECs and deposit it um, just like they deposit any other receipt. So it's pretty it's pretty darn handy for that, and I, you know what, what a lot of what I work in is I'm making the pro forma work for renewables projects. So um, it comes in pretty handy on governments. For instance, I just did a um, a deal with a local county um, to put a solar project on their landfill. Now that was property that would be wasted, um, or you know it's property they'd have to pay to have maintained actually, and so they were. Uh, very happy with the idea of, of, of creating revenue there. In order to make that deal work, uh, we gave them as the landowner the RECs because they could take those. And then we brought in private investors um, to take the tax credits. And it, it worked out very handy. So we actually did a 20-year deal. We took the RECs from the project. We gave them to the county. The county put them directly into the program that Walter runs. And um, so they've got a 20-year revenue stream from that. Uh, so it's, it's, it's an excellent attribute to uh, the financial modeling. I'm trying to make one of these work. Now, as um, the market has evolved, it's um, a little bit trickier to monetize those wrecks. And, and so the, the people writing the huge checks often don't like them as much, whereas for the government, it can just be gravy for the project. So, um, so it works out pretty good. So is there a national marketplace for wrecks, or are they sold more state to state? Um, that, that's, a, that's a great question. It, it, it depends. Whether you're talking compliance or if you're talking voluntary. Compliance, you've got to go back and look at each renewable portfolio standard. Um, in North Carolina, you can accept or the state will accept up to 25% of the, the benchmark number to be purchased by RECs generated anywhere in the United States. That happens to be the most lenient RPS out there. Um, if you take some of the northeastern states, they only allow states that border them to purchase RECs for the RPS. Uh, so it's a state-to-state -state variant. However, when you talk about the voluntary market, it's a robust national marketplace. When RECs generated, you know, in the, in the middle of the country are purchased all the time on the East Coast because they're abundance in their price. When you look at, at the at the market here in North Carolina, if you want a local solar rec, it's going to be more expensive because of the scarcity and the locale. So it's really neat that the characteristic of the rec and the vintage or when it was created and how, how current or recent it was generated plays a lot into you know, how much value they hold. We found that the more locally based the REC is, the more value it holds, both for the individual purchasing it and using the REC for um, the environmental attributes that it, um, that it holds, 
or, and for the individual that is producing the REC and, and selling it. So can you speak to any difficulties or problems that the REC market has faced? You know, actually, it's uh, the biggest problem that we've had probably could be ascribed to the success of the solar industry. Um, you know, we talked about how originally RECs were driven by the compliance market, by the requirements that I, I talked about in the, in the renewable portfolio standards. Um, those, when they were set up, they didn't anticipate how um, inexpensive and uh, solar would get and how fast it would grow. So uh, most of the markets basically um, have already filled up requirements that don't come due till 2017 or 2018. Uh, that has caused the value of the REC to go down um, because suddenly you don't, the utility companies don't need them and, and they're not driving the price anymore. Um, so you've seen, for instance, New Jersey used to have this sort of spectacular market where you could get $600 per REC, which is amazing. It's down to $100 now, which I would still very good compared to the rest of the country, but it gives you a, a sense of the scale. In North Carolina, um, it used to be that I, you would hear about you know ninety dollars a rec and then eighty. And at this point, utilities won't give you five dollars for a rec because they filled up their um, requirements through 2017, 2018. Um, so the difficulty in the market is for a, a developer of a project, or uh, say a government that would like to have a project and use the rec to get uh, value for that for that commodity. Um, and then that's, that's really what drove us to set up the uh, program we did um, here to, to aggregate and to monetize those. It was really to aggressively go after the voluntary market and then to create stable sense of revenue for that. Um, you know, I, the future for Rex is going to be bright because we're going to constantly um, be pushed more and more towards doing something about our emissions profiles. But um, there are definitely some challenges right now on uh, what you do with them, how you monetize them. Great. Well, thank you, Rich and Walter. This has been very informative. And to learn more about how governments can utilize RECs as easily as private entities, you can visit the Shift Equity Group's website online at shiftequity.com. And you can also find out more about the Sunshot Solar Outreach Partnerships work on NARC's website, narc.org backslash solar op. So thanks, everyone, and I'll see you in the new year. Thank you for listening. For more information about NARC, please visit narc.org.